皆様大変お待たせいたしましたただいまより c t e c 2 0 1 9カンファレンスを始めさせていただきます20周年を迎えた c t e c はつながる社会競争する未来をテーマに CPS、IoT などのテクノロジーを活用した未来を発信するソサエティ 5.0 の総合展ですこちらの英会場では c t e c キーノートサミットを開催し各業界のトップリーダーよりご講演をいただいておりますそれではただいまよりマース革命に備えると題しまして Easy マイル R&D CTO ペジバンベイグイ様よりご講演をいただきますそれではペジバンベイグイ様よろしくお願いいたしますこんにちは。All these companies who are investing billions of dollars in autonomous driving, what's the purpose? I drive very well my car, why would I need an autonomous vehicle? And somebody else in the audience said, I work in the automotive industry, I can answer that. And he said, basically, when you have autonomous vehicles, then all the people who are、uh, disabled or who are too young or too old to drive, then maybe. I can sell them those vehicles. And this to me showed that we, as an industry in the AV, automat-、uh, autonomous vehicles、uh, industry, have not been very good at conveying why we're doing this and why it's very important.、Uh, because the answer couldn't be further from the truth. So let me、uh, begin by, ex- by explaining why we do autonomous vehicles and what difference autonomous vehicles will make. Um, first of all, in many, many countries,、uh, people drive easily one to two hours each way to go to the office. And you know, that's a very unproductive use of anybody's time. So, autonomous vehicles would, first of all, regain that,、uh, that time and allow people to either spend it productively, working in the car, for example, while the car is driving itself. Or、uh, family time, etc. So that's the very、uh, first reason. The second thing is that once vehicles are actually fully autonomous, it means that the same way that you can order a taxi today, you will be able to order an autonomous vehicle tomorrow. And you can go anywhere you want with that vehicle. The only difference being that once the driver's costs are removed from that、uh, vehicle, Uh, basically, the price is going to go down by something like 80%. And so, riding in an autonomous vehicle will be extremely cheap. It will be so cheap, actually, that if you think about buying a car, a car is a very expensive asset. It depreciates really rapidly the moment you get out of the dealership, and you know, it spends 95% of its time parked and not being used. So, that's very poor use of. Your money and capital, and at the same time, it's a very poor use of all the productive capacity and goods that we are producing. So, tomorrow, if an autonomous vehicle can drive itself to you and take you anywhere you want, then you don't need to own a car. And if you don't need to own a car, it means that the entire automotive industry is going to be、uh, revolutionized and they will need to reinvent themselves. So, typically, Um, car manufacturers will not sell their cars to you, the、uh, customer of today, but they will most probably have to reinvent themselves either as mobility providers or sell those vehicles to a fleet of autonomy providers and mobility providers. So the whole car industry is going to have to reinvent themselves. And then following that, what are the insurers going to do? The insurers. They will also have to reinvent themselves because they're not going to be assuring the driver because there is no more driver. 
And so this uh, very large industry, uh, which is the insurance industry, will also have to reinvent themselves. And then you can imagine that it's not only going to happen for people uh, mobility, it's also going to happen for uh, any transport. So road transport, today 80% of all the goods are transported in trucks. And so the same uh, disruption is going to happen for the transports of goods. Uh, and yes, uh, there is two very large benefits as well that are the most obvious ones. The first one being that we expect autonomous vehicles to be safer because you know, they don't get sleepy, they don't get drunk, and they don't need to send text messages while driving. So that's a very good benefit. Um, and also people who currently uh, cannot drive will be able to uh, also much more easily move from uh, place to place. So this whole thing where you know, mobility as a service has been emerging over the past few years, it's gonna become really enabled uh, thanks to autonomous vehicles by bringing the cost down and making the assets uh, used almost 100% of the time. So the, the role of the fleet managers and the mobility providers would be to make sure that when a car drives somebody and drops that person off, it's ready to pick up somebody else. And so uh, the whole system would become much more productive and much more uh, optimal. Um, so in order to uh, go further, I need to, uh, to introduce the different level of uh, autonomy. So uh, the SAE has introduced many years ago the concept of levels of autonomy. Uh, the first level being the level zero, where you actually don't have any autonomous features. So you basically drive manually and the car cannot do anything. That's level zero. Then you have uh, the level one called driver assistance. And driver assistance means that the vehicle can either brake or accelerate or steer, but not the two at the same time. So two examples of level one would be emergency braking systems and lane keeping assist. So these are two scenarios where your car might today have a level one feature. Then it's partial automation, so level two. This means that you can take your hands off but you still need to continuously monitor what the vehicle is doing and monitor the road. So examples of that would be maybe valet parking, uh, the car can park itself, uh, or uh, Tesla's autopilot. So this is a level two system. You need to continuously monitor what the car is doing. It's not made to be fully autonomous. Uh, level three is a higher level of automation called conditional automation, and it means that you can basically uh, remove your eyes from the road, but you still need to be ready to take over in case of unexpected situations. Um, this level is very tricky. Uh, today there is no vehicles that feature a level three uh, system. And my personal opinion is that it's really, really hard to get it right because if the vehicle wants you to take over, it means that something unexpected has happened uh, that it cannot manage. And so, that means that if you're, for example, you know, your eyes are off, maybe you're watching a movie, you're reading a book, um, maybe you will find yourself, you'll find yourself in a dangerous situation. So level three is, is, quite, uh, is quite blurry. Then we have level four, which is high automation, and the vehicle is fully autonomous under limited conditions. And there is no definition of what those limited conditions are every uh, developer of such system can define its own conditions. Um, and finally, the level five, which is that it's fully autonomous under all the situations. And uh, today we're very, very far from achieving that, but that's what everybody is expecting to achieve. So one of the things that people have been complaining about with these different levels is that because it's incremental, it leads to believe that one can start from level zero and you know, uh, go from step to step to level five. The problem is that, as I tried to explain, there is a major gap or a very large step, if you want, between the level two and the level three. And there's also an extremely large step between uh, the level four and the level five. So, um, so in my view, there is two ways of approaching that. Either we do incrementally, 
uh, as most people thought they would be doing and car manufacturers have uh, started doing, or we can start actually by level four, which means we are fully autonomous, but the, those conditions under which we are autonomous are very limited, and we can grow from there. So, so yes, we can either iteratively over time go from zero to five, or we start from um, level four. And one thing that uh, we've seen is that the problem with level two and level three is that uh, humans are really poor at actually monitoring robots. It's very boring and nobody wants to just look at the road and do nothing. And uh, even those who want, they almost always end up uh, falling asleep, for example. So we have many, many examples where uh, actually the Tesla autopilot approach leads to dangerous behavior. The first uh, reason is that it's a boring task to do, so many people just don't wanna do it. And the second thing is that uh, human beings tend to become overconfident in the capacity and the abilities of the system. So they believe that the car can do much better than what it actually can. So Tesla's autopilot has not been designed to be operating without a continuous and constant human supervision. And so if, uh, as these people have been falling asleep under the, behind the wheel, there has been a lot of accidents caused by uh, these scenarios and it's very dangerous. So at Easy Mile, we decided that it's easier to start directly from level four. And there is a very uh, good quote that I like about this is, the electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. At some point, we need to start from scratch and build something brand new. And that's what we did with the EZ10, uh, which was first released in 2015. And this is the second generation uh, that we've been selling throughout the world. And it's fully electric, first of all. Um, and second of all, as you can see, there is no wing mirrors, there is no steering wheel, there is no driver's seat, and it's fully symmetrical, so the vehicle can go um, you know, in both directions without uh, needing to do a U-turn, for example. So I have a short video to present to you what it looks like in real conditions. So this is an actual location where we have deployed the vehicle. It's near our headquarters in Toulouse, France. And this vehicle is really ideally suited for corporate campuses, business parks, amusement parks, where we need to move people around. Um, and again, as it's electric, it's uh, zero emissions. So we have a taxi mode uh, where you can actually call for the vehicle to come and pick you up at a designated location and take you to you know, predefined stops. So how do autonomous vehicles work? Because they need to perceive their environment. And generally speaking, there are three, three steps. The first step is I perceive my environment. So human beings, they have eyes to perceive their environments. Uh, and uh, autonomous vehicles have much more than eyes. So it's easy to imagine that with cameras, we can do computer vision. 
and uh, see our surrounding, but we have more options on autonomous vehicles. So typically, we use also radars, and radars are very good, for example, uh, for seeing in very tough conditions, such as fog and radars uh, and all that, and they're very uh, widely used in emergency braking systems, for example. And what's mostly the defining uh, sensor for autonomous vehicles is the use of LIDARs. So LIDARs, they emit light, and uh, they receive the light, so it's an, uh, it's an active sensor, and that allows to see the world in three dimension. And th this, again, has helped uh, a lot the autonomous vehicles to uh, be able to very accurately perceive their environment, because once you have an autonomous vehicle, you really need to position yourself almost to the centimeter level precision. So uh, as most of you have no idea how a LiDAR works, I will just show you an example of what a vehicle would see with the LiDARs. So that's the output of a very high uh, definition, which means very, very expensive LiDAR from uh, our partner Velodyne. And LiDARs have made such huge progress over the past few years that now you can almost get a uh, camera image quality with uh, the LiDARs. And the benefit of these LiDARs, again, is that you see in full 3D. Uh, but the challenge here is that for us humans, it's easy to say, oh, here is a car, here is the lane, here, is, here are trees. But we actually need very complicated algorithms to be able to distinguish which points in this 3D point cloud are actual cars and what's behind those point clouds. And uh, these are the kind of things that roboticists and uh, deep learning AI engineers are working on. So um, not only you need the sensor, but then you need very complicated algos to do the work behind it. And that's, that's why it's really, really hard to do autonomous vehicles is because not only the sensors need to be uh, highly improved for perception, but then you need to be able to understand your surrounding to understand uh, what's moving, what's not moving, uh, and what are the intent. So the intent prediction is currently one of the areas that is uh, non-resolved and which makes uh, autonomous vehicles really hard. So now that we understand how uh, autonomous vehicles work, let's talk a bit about uh, the automotive industry. So um, the automotive industry is, uh, the purpose of this slide is to show you that uh, it's a very large industry. So there is about 100 million cars being produced every year, every year yet throughout the world. And that means that we are basically producing about three cars every single second uh, to, during the year. So massive uh, production of cars. There are today uh, more than 15 million people working directly uh, in the automotive industry, and uh, that uh, increases to about 60 million if you add all the indirect employment. So, uh, you know, a large number of people. And then if we were to consider this industry uh, revenue uh, and compare it to the GDP of any one country, then it would be um, the sixth largest economy in the world. So, these are the biggest countries uh, according to the United Nations. And the uh, automotive industry would be here. So it would be bigger than France, for example, as an industry. It would be very close to the United Kingdom. So why I'm saying that is because um, it's a very, very large industry that has reached a tremendous scale over the past uh, uh, 100 years. And it's been uh, optimizing everything for low cost, high performance, high throughput, which is very good. We've achieved really great results uh, in the autom automotive industry. Uh, vehicles hardly uh, break now. Uh, but at the same time, what it means is that it's just such a giant industry that it comes with also a very, very uh, high inertia. So making things change in this industry is going to be very hard. And that's not because one company is you know, uh, refusing to change, but it's just that everything has been optimized for throughput and it's moving at a high velocity and changing things is really hard. And on top of that, as I mentioned, autonomous vehicles are actually um, mostly driven by new sensors that didn't exist like LIDARs. 
and also their uh, bleeding edge software, so robotics, deep learning. So these are things that uh, basically car manufacturers had never dealt with until today. So they don't really understand how this works and it's gonna be really hard to change all the processes and everything to actually integrate them into uh, the vehicles. And the second thing is that, and that also probably one of the reasons why a lot of uh, mistakes happen, is that most people think that, yes, you know, an autonomous vehicle is just the next iteration of any car, right? I have a car and the next generation of that car would be autonomous. And I think this leads to a number of mistakes because my view is autonomous vehicles are actually a brand new product. And if we, if we consider it as a brand new product, then we have to reassess our expectations of that product. Let me show you why. So this is a uh, chart of the number of miles driven in the United States and the fatality rate in the United States. Um, the same chart applies with the same uh, numbers in Europe uh, and I would assume that in Japan is uh, lower in terms of the number of miles but most probably the fatality rate would be the same. So anybody who works in the automotive industry or the uh, autonomous vehicles industry has seen this chart. And so if you look at it, uh, in 2017 there is 3 trillion miles being driven. 3 trillion. That's just uh, unfathomable. And at the same time, we can see that uh, the number of people dying on the road is about um, 30,000. So that's a huge number, and it's still an unacceptable number because so many people die on the road. But at the same time, first of all, if you look at how the chart has been declining over the past 100 years, we've just achieved so much in terms of safety. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you look at how many miles one has to drive before having the uh, statistical probability of dying on the road, you would have to drive about 150 million miles. That means that if you drive 10,000 miles a year, which is you know, what most people would probably do, then you would have to drive for 15,000 years for having you know, a statistical chance of dying on the road. So we just achieved such an uh, uh, amazing result here. And if you consider uh, autonomous vehicles to be an incremental improvement of existing cars, then you need to be better than that. And if you need to be better than that, it means that you have to be able to guarantee that your vehicles uh, are gonna have less uh, fatalities than uh, human drivers. And it happens that human drivers are actually very good at driving. And if you remove uh, people who die because of uh, you know, drunkenness or texting and all that, all of a sudden people are actually even better than that at driving and it's not 150 million miles, it's probably more that you have to drive. And so we have two problems here, is that how can I prove that my vehicles are safer than this if I have to drive many vehicles, 150 million miles. And in any case, it wouldn't be acceptable to say, let's deploy vehicles and prove it because we have to show that we are gonna kill less people, but we still need to kill people, right? And so that doesn't work. And the second thing is that over the past 100 years where you know, we see this uh, chart, an enormous amount of safety procedures, testing procedures have been defined for existing vehicles, and these vehicles are mostly electromechanical. And autonomous vehicles, they're just software, and they're very high-end, very complex software, and we don't have yet the methodologies uh, and the ways to assess their safety. So this is an open question. Nobody is able to prove the safety of their vehicle today, and you know it's probably gonna take a number of years uh, before we achieve that. It took 100 years for actual vehicles. If it takes 10 years for autonomous vehicles, it's already a great achievement. But so, does it mean that we shouldn't deploy autonomous vehicles before 10 years, despite all the benefits that we've seen before? So, my point is, this chart is very important, but it shouldn't be the only chart that we look at. 
There are a number of other figures that we can, uh, that we can look at. So these are still from the US, but there are six million car accidents per year in the US, three million people injured every year, and two million of which experience permanent injuries. So these are not fatalities, but permanent injuries are pretty serious and pretty bad. And at the same time, 58% of all uh, fatal car accidents involve only one vehicle. So it means that either somebody collided against a tree or a wall, or that there was a pedestrian or a cyclist uh, involved. So these are situations where autonomous vehicles today can do very well. And finally, well, um, if you see, uh, there is 1.6 million car crashes which were caused by the use of phones. And again, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, either they don't need to phone while driving or they can do it very safely because a, a car, you know, a computer can do everything at once. And uh, the most, um, the, the biggest figure here is the cost of traffic accidents in the US in 2010. I couldn't find a uh, more up-to-date number. We can probably imagine that today is higher than uh, 2010, but it, it was about uh, $900 billion spent uh, or the cost of total car accidents. And these are serious figures. And there is probably benefits of the, trying to do something about it. And so I think that there is some uh, underestimated opportunities here and that we can still deploy autonomous vehicles, maybe not in dense urban environments, maybe not widely everywhere, but at least there are areas where we can start deploying them. So typically, as I mentioned for the EZ10, we have business parks, corporate campuses, university campuses, factories, where we can deploy autonomous vehicles. And we've seen many local communities, for example, in the US or in new developments in China or Asia in general, where people actually decide that, yeah, we're not gonna use cars within the community, we are gonna park them outside, and we will use autonomous vehicles within the community. Or in China, they are considering actually creating new districts, new cities, and creating dedicated lines for these autonomous vehicles so that we can easily deploy them and make, the, make this happen. And finally, um, industrial vehicles as well. There is a lot of opportunities for deploying robots. We've already seen a lot of uh, autonomous robots being deployed in uh, warehouses and factories where actually you know, human uh, beings are not allowed. So, you know, space dedicated for robots. And uh, we can uh, also do the same for tractors, for forklifts, uh, etc. And so there is opportunities for leveraging autonomous technology today. And that's what EasyMile is trying to do with uh, the Easy 10 and the other products that we are working on. And that concludes my presentation. And thank you very much. どうもありがとうございましたデジパンレイグイ様にご講演をいただきましたありがとうございましたそれでは以上をもちまして講演を終了させていただきます本日はご来場いただきまして誠にありがとうございました c t e c 2 0 1 9カンファレンスにご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございましたお帰りの際お忘れ物ございませんようどうぞ気をつけてご退出ください